Okay, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm presenting information on the Humboldt Bay Regional Invasive Spartina Management Plan. Um, I want to note that I'm presenting information from a fairly high general level. I think it's more meaningful for me to get across sort of the overall purpose of the plan and what it's going to accomplish rather than the nuanced details. Uh, we're currently finalizing the plan, so you'll be able to read about those details <laughs> soon. Uh, the goals of the project are to restore native tidal marsh communities through Spartina eradication and to adaptively manage against future Spartina infestations throughout the management area. And the management area is Humboldt Bay, uh, the Eel River Estuary uh, directly to the south of Humboldt Bay and the Mad River Estuary directly to the north of Humboldt Bay. <clears throat> uh, recently, the refuge uh, completed mapping Spartina distribution throughout that management area. And it, in addition to gathering information on the distribution of Spartina, they got information about the percent cover in various cover classes. And so in Humboldt Bay, we now know that there's a little over 1,000 acres. It's all Spartina dense of Florida, to be clear. And um, pretty evenly distributed among the different percent uh, cover classes in Humboldt Bay. It's also pretty substantial amount of Spartina in the Eel River estuary, about 660 acres, and also uh, distributed among those cover classes, low, medium, and high. Relatively, there's a lot less Spartina in the Mad River estuary, a total of seven acres, and most of that, five acres of it, are at uh, low percent cover. I want to take a minute to describe what I'll refer to as sort of the programmatic nature of the plan rather than the project level nature. Um, if it was a project level plan, then we would know and plan for from the get go the really specific timing of uh, control efforts as well as the type of methods for control and so forth. And, and with that, then we could really do a detailed assessment of the implications of the treatment at that project level, both the benefits and impacts and so forth. However, there's some factors that prevent us from doing that detailed of an analysis all up front for the entire management area. Um, first off, there's some uncertainty regarding the rate and timing for funding that's going to become available to control Spartina. There's also some remaining question about the effectiveness and cost of different control methods, though we're gaining information about that daily. And finally, it's um, important to consider the fact that Spartina is distributed across all different ownerships, different public owners, different private owners. And there's also just a lot of different people that are going to continue to be involved in Spartina control from the federal agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service, state, the Coastal Conservancy, Arcata, Eureka, the county, private landowners, and so forth. And because of those uncertainties regarding funding, um, the effectiveness of different methods, and the different, uh, all the different players involved, we can't get to that level of detail of a project level plan. So what we've developed is, we're nearly finished developing is a sort of more of what I'll refer to as a programmatic level plan. And what, what we're achieving is we're, we're establishing a structure, um, if you will, for implementing Spartina control and eventually eradication in a more efficient and um, coordinated manner rather than all different landers coming with their own idea about how they're going to control Spartina on their land. It'll be coordinated, coordinated and allowing for more efficiency, which I'll speak to kind of throughout this presentation. Um, I do want to touch more on this idea of coordination. Again, the need for it is because of all the different ownerships and entities at play. And one thing we've recognized from the get-go in, in developing this plan is there's a real need for one entity to provide a centralized coordination role, a, a coordinating entity, if you will. There's a few primary things that entity would do. Um, they would maintain data on the distribution of Spartina, um, where Spartina has been treated, and, and, and ecological information as it comes forward. Um, they'll also coordinate all the interested parties 
in terms of prioritizing efforts as funding becomes available, identifying where the next place that funding should be applied for control should be, what methods should be used. And finally, and, and, and this is, would be great, we, we don't know if we can achieve it, but if, if that one entity could hold the permits for conducting Spartina control throughout the management area, then that would also result in huge uh, savings in terms of efficiency of time and cost. Rather than each individual project having to get permitted separately, that one entity could hold all the permits. Um, one entity that a lot of people believe would be very good for doing this is the Humboldt Bay Harbor Recreation and Conservation District. Um, they're currently heavily involved in the work that's going on the, at the refuge. Um, I've had discussions with staff at the Humboldt Bay Harbor District and I think it's a very promising entity to do that. Of course, the district has a um, elected board, and so that board needs to hear this and um, consider whether they think it's appropriate, and we plan on discussing it with that board within the next few months. So the primary components of the plan that I'm going to discuss are this idea of regional coordination, which I already discussed, so never mind that, but, but I'm going to discuss reprioritizing through time um, where we should be focusing our efforts and with what methods, um, cost estimates for controlling Spartina, an outreach program that's been developed through this plan, and a permitting strategy. In the plan itself, um, we consider a, a large variety of both mechanical and chemical herbicide treatments. And we leave those in the plan as tools that can be picked from through time as um, local entities coordinate and learn more, again, about the effectiveness and cost of these different methods, different methods and reprioritize. We didn't want to leave anything out because we've generally felt that there's not enough known about any individual method for it to be completely removed from the table. Um, I'll discuss this a little more in a bit, but we're also developing a programmatic environmental impact report for the project, which will give us more information about these methods and may result in us um, narrowing it down some. Um, so again, you know, given the uncertainties about the timing of funding, um, the effectiveness of different methods, it's, it's critical, we believe, as well, if we got all the money we needed at once, there'd be no reason to prioritize. We would treat everything. That may not happen, and it may not be likely to happen. So we're going to have to reprioritize continuously into the future, perhaps every year looking back, see what's still left out there in terms of Spartina. Uh, what methods have been working best? How much money do we have this year? Who's the, where's the willing landowner? So forth. There's lots of different things to consider. Um, and you know, there's three other real key parameters that we've used to um, develop sort of a prioritization uh, decision-making framework, if you will. One is the in invasibility of any site. Um, how sensitive is a given site to being invaded by Spartina? And in general, sites that have recently been treated have a high level of invasibility because there's more bare ground. That makes them a higher priority for treatment. Secondly, the propagule pressure. Uh, what we're referring to here is how much seed is likely to come off a site and reach another site that has a high level of invasibility. If, if it's likely to contribute a lot of seed to another site and infest that site, then um, higher priority. And third, containment. If a lot of containment's already been conducted in an area or at a site, then we want to protect what we've done there. We don't want it, we don't want to lose that investment, if you will. So a higher level of existing containment also makes the site a higher priority for um, control. It's been shown in other areas, the work up in Washington, that it's very difficult to estimate the cost of controlling Spartina at a programmatic level like we're trying to do. Once you get down to having to develop a site-specific plan, um, there's things that you, you couldn't have otherwise known until you get there, such as access issues, um, different nuances with the soil types, and, and uh, so forth. 
However, we have given it a pr pretty good shot. We, we do have a lot of empirical data collected by Andrea and Annie and others about and Joel and the cost of um, different treatment methods. So largely based upon that empirical information as well as information about the cost of treating different um, areas with different percent cover, we have developed some estimates. And right now, uh, through the range of control methods we're looking at and the assumptions, we're estimating at somewhere between four and $11 million to eradicate Spartina throughout that management area. <clears throat> Outreach is, of course, a really critical component. Um, outreach to the public to make sure they have an understanding of the ecological benefits that are come from native salt marshes versus um, Spartina, uh, nearly homogenous stands with Spartina, for example. And, and I know a lot of the pre presentations today will relate to that. Um, outreach to people that need to be involved with the eradication of Spartina, landowners, public agencies, and so forth. And outreach again to the public so they know how they can actually be involved in the direct control of Spartina, whether it means coming on a volunteer day with a shovel or helping establish uh, public access by talking to their neighbors, so forth. Finally, the, the plan includes a permitting strategy. Um, this list here is by no means an exhaustive list of the different permits that might be required. These are some of sort of the highlights. Um, I, I don't think I'll go through it all, but I, I, one thing I think is uh, definitely noteworthy is uh, the Federal and California Endangered Species Act and how this is uh, posed to comply with that. And the, the approach we're taking in terms of that is we believe we've developed the plan in such a way that it's not going to impact species that are listed under the California or Federal Endangered Species Act. We think we can go about this in a way to avoid impacts that would result in the need for permits. Um, the main species that could potentially be impacted are Tidewater goby and Salmonids, but we don't think the way we're going about it will impact them. Um, of course, there's a number of uh, other state and federal permits that will need to be obtained, as well as a permit from the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, uh, approvals from private landowners. And I'll, I'll just mention again, you know, with this long list of permits that are required these days for doing this type of work, the more the cons permitting process can be consolidated into one effort, say by one uh, coordinating entity, the more efficient it will be. Um, dramatically in terms of time and cost to implement it. So in summary, the plan provides mechanisms for regional coordination of efforts resulting in improved efficiencies, um, a process for constantly reprioritizing efforts in terms of where to treat and what methods to use based upon new information that's constantly coming in, cost estimates, which are also important for reprioritization, but also really important for when we're pursuing funding. Of course, when you're pursuing funding, it's very helpful if you can tell the potential funder how much your project's gonna cost. Um, an outreach strategy to involve the public and, and everyone that needs to be involved and, and the permitting strategy that hopefully is gonna lead into more efficient consolidated permitting. Briefly, um, of course, I wanna thank my colleagues at HT Harvey and Associates Carol Vandermeer, who I saw somewhere in here, who uh, managed the uh, outreach portion of the plan. Kim Patton from Washington State University. He, he provided information about what they've learned up there, controlling Spartina, and commented really meaningfully on lots of parts of the plan in terms of ecology and control methods. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service for all the research they've done and all the control they've already done, the tireless work of Andrea. Um, and of course, Joel Gerwine for all his work in our area, um, providing funding for this effort and so many other efforts. And Windsor and Kelly, um, and who their skill staff is now also assisting with the uh, environmental impact report portion of this project. And uh, Donna Ball, my colleague is here and um, as well, and we're both available for questions now or through email or calls in the future.